How's everyone tonight? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Good to be with God's people, especially after a Thanksgiving week, a Thanksgiving week and weekend off from last week. We didn't meet on Wednesday. So tonight we get to cover our new uh, book for the, uh, for the next study would be the book of Malachi, the book of Malachi. And it's a fascinating book. It is the last book in your Old Testament Bible. It is the last book in your Christian Bible in the Old Testament. It is not the last book in the Hebrew Bible. That would be the book of Chronicles. And we'll talk about that in a moment. As we turn there, let's come before the Lord and ask him for his grace to study tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you that we have our Bibles. We do thank you, Lord, that we can open them in freedom. We can open them, Lord, without any restrictions. We praise you for what it says. We praise you, Lord, that these are your words uh, given to us through the Spirit and made sense to us only by the Spirit. And because of Jesus, we're able to have your promises. Yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So, Lord, we ask you tonight, please open our minds, our hearts to you, to your word, to your truth. And by your Spirit, Lord, may we be led to... Uh, Come to the feet of Jesus, as it would be Mary. Lord, she preferred, she she chose the better thing, which was to listen to you. And Lord, there's a lot of things that we can do tonight. There's a lot of things that we could have done. But Lord, as Mary said, as Jesus said, Mary chose the better thing. And so Lord, help us that as we choose the better thing, that's to listen to you, we'll be able to understand more of your word and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Malachi, part of the 12, you know, the 12, the 12 minor prophets, the ones that all Christians run away from because they don't understand them. And um, many times they're in such a hurry to get to John 3.16 that we miss very much what it says. And even if we do read what it says, many times we misunderstand the whole point of the 12 minor prophets, which Malachi is one of them. Remember, as we go through Malachi, we always keep an eye on the fact that it leads us to what the book of Revelation says, the new Jerusalem. This is part of our journey, part of the way. It is part of God's word. It's to be treated as all the other parts, but just like every book, it's part of a whole that leads us to the end. The end is the New Jerusalem. As a way of notes, if you want to write these down or if you've taken notes before, the 12 minor prophets took place over a 300-year period. 300-year period. And in your Bible, it includes the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. The time of those 12, they prophesied um, during a 300-year period, which corresponds to those three books of history, what we consider history on the left side. They're more than just history, but they have a lot of historical uh, information there on those three books. Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. Of course, in our Bibles, they're divided into two books each. First, second Samuel, first, second Kings, first, second Chronicles. And they depict a story of God's chosen people, God's chosen people that were chosen by God to be God's agents, God's messengers, God's people, God's witness to the Gentile world, to the world about God's love and God's forgiveness and God's ultimate restoration. And so the 12 minor prophets gives us a unique perspective about God, a very unique perspective about the Lord. Remember, if you're reading Malachi back in the Old Testament, you don't know about the 400 years of silence coming up in the... Um, and you know that blank page between Malachi and Matthew that you can go to? That blank page that goes, what's that blank page for? Well, that represents 400 years between Old and New Testament. It's one system, one group of scriptures together. But if you didn't know back then that the New Testament was coming, you would think this is the end of the Bible. You would think that this is the end of the Bible. And of course, when Jesus came, that's all it had, all the way up to Malachi. And so when we read today about the scriptures, about Malachi, we have to keep in mind two things. As Christians, we remember that as we look at Israel, we have to use our bifocals, if you have any. 
If you don't, that's too bad. It doesn't work with your glasses. But mine, is, mine do. Mine has bifocals. You look at Israel, and by representation, we also can look at the promises of God for Israel as it applies to the body of Christ, as it applies to the body of Christ. So it's not only we're looking at Israel, we're also looking at ourselves, because the same God that dealt with Israel is the same God that deals with us today. Now, I do have to tell you something about Malachi and the way people have misunderstood it, the way people have misunderstood it, as they misunderstand a lot of the minor prophets. The church, mostly, as a whole, today, will look at the prophets, the minor prophets, as well as the major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel, and they will look at as these promises that are in here, these promises that are in all the Old Testament for Israel are literal, but because Israel has broken the covenant, they did not keep the covenant that was made with them, and ultimately they rejected Jesus, then Israel has no place in God's plan, and the promises of God will never come to pass. This is one way that the church looks at the Old Testament prophets, one of the ways. They say, see, God's promises are there. Israel failed to keep the promises. They failed to keep the covenant. Therefore, all the promises, and even the ones you read today in Malachi, will not come to pass. Israel has been void, null and void, and these promises will never happen. Most of the church and Christian circles today will teach that. Most of it will teach that. Another one will teach that the promises, yes, they will come to pass. However, even though they will come to pass, they are going to be applied spiritually to the church. They will be applied spiritually to the church. We call that replacement theology. Replacement the theology. For those who study that, the theological term is supersessionism. Supersessionism. I know, big words, boring, right? But you have to know this because people will oftentimes use those words interchangeably and you may not know what they're talking about. Replacement theology, supersessionism, the belief that all of God's promises in the Old Testament will come to pass, but they will be applied only to the body of Christ spiritually. So when it says that Israel will grow and multiply and have a blessing, they are attributed to church growth, evangelism and church growth. So when we're talking about Jerusalem, they only think of the heavenly Jerusalem. They don't think about the earthly Jerusalem. And when they talk about things that are happening to Israel, literally, they believe it will happen spiritually to the church. Because that's replacement theology. Another way they do this is they say the blessings is for the church, the curses is for the Jews. And uh, very anti-Semitism, right? Very anti-Semitic in the way that they understand the scriptures. They don't believe that Israel has any part of God's plan, even though the promises are true. They've been transposed unto the body of Christ, upon Christians. And so they ignore that, they could, that the, the, the promises of God are literal. Uh, another way that they do that is say, well, when Jesus came, all the promises of God came to pass on his first coming. All of them happened because Jesus is like the new Israel. See, God was expecting Israel to be a certain way, and so Jesus comes and he fulfills it all. And so all the promises happen when Jesus first came in the New Testament. However, that's not all there is, and I don't, think, uh, I don't think anyone here in this church believes that, although we always have to be, we remind them because it's so easy to fall back into that, that we do believe. I do believe that the promises of God in this book and the Old Testament will happen literally to Israel, will happen literally to Israel, and that puts us in a very, very small minority of Christians, that we believe that the promises of God will happen to Israel, literally, and they all relate to the future. There is a future restoration of God's people. So when we say all Israel must be saved, the replacement theologians say, oh, see, the Christian church will be complete. Now, we believe that all Israel must be saved means exactly what Paul meant. All Israel must be saved. Jewish people representing all the 12 tribes of Israel 
will come to faith in Jesus. It will be a representation of full Israel, of all Israel in the last days. And I'm not alone in this because if you read the New Testament, Paul makes that case. Romans, the book of Romans, especially 9 through 11, makes us clear that Israel has a place in God's prophetic plan. It will happen in the end. A Redeemer will come out of Zion, and all of Israel will be saved. So we can know that they'll happen in the future. It will happen at the coming of Jesus. But we're in the book of Malachi. We're in the book of Malachi a hundred years after the captivity of Israel. Remember, Israel went into Syria. Judah went into Babylon. And a hundred years later, we have the book of Malachi. So we're roughly speaking about the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. And I always encourage believers, as you read the scriptures, always go to the parallel account, meaning that there's another book that happened at the same time as Malachi. Ezra and especially Nehemiah. What is happening in Ezra and Nehemiah, Malachi is explaining in a more theological way. Although they deal with things in Ezra and Nehemiah, Malachi is explaining things at a deeper level, meaning the problem of Israel with their hearts. So a hundred years later, about uh, 80 years after Zechariah, so we just finished Zechariah a couple of weeks ago, so we're fast-forwarding 80 years into the future, and we end up at Malachi, end up at Malachi. So what was Israel's condition at the time? What was the Jewish people condition at the time? In one word, disillusioned. Disillusioned. What does disillusion mean? Anyone know? I don't want to answer questions. Today is Wednesday night. Sorry. What's that? Not delusional. Disillusion, meaning disappointed. What's that? Don't know the truth? Well, they're disappointed. They have been disillusioned. Maybe you have been disillusioned. You expected something out of whatever new thing that you're going to start or, or you're disillusioned in your relationships or you're disillusioned in your career or you're disillusioned into whatever it may be. They came into the land from Babylon, from exile, with all the desire to rebuild the temple, which they did. They rebuilt the temple. They came back to the land, and they read things like Haggai and Zechariah, and they said, whoa, God has not forgotten us. We have a place in God's time here. God is going to restore us. He's going to destroy the nations around us. He's going to set up the kingdom here, and we will be completely independent and back under God's kingdom with the Messiah. And 80 years later, it had not happened. So the people became disillusioned. They said, well, Nehemiah is here and Ezra is here, but most people don't live in Jerusalem. They live outside in the, country, in the countryside. Most of the nations around us don't want us. People are fighting. People are arguing. The temple is so small compared to uh, Solomon's temple. And they've become disappointed. Disappointed. And the priesthood was not doing any better. Instead of encouraging God's people and bringing them to faith in Jesus or, or faith in God and back to the law, they had become also desperate and complacent. And many of them had actually put away the thought that God would do anything for them anymore. And they began to think of, like, is it worth it? Why do we care? What's the point of following God if nothing happens? What is the issue here? God, I pray, and we go through the rituals, and nothing happens. It's like it's God, if God is not answering our prayers. Was it worth it? Where's the kingdom? And then people began to not care anymore. And this is what happened to Israel or the Jewish people at the time. Remember, the problem was idolatry. What led them into captivity? The worship of false gods and idols. The worship of false gods and idols. But now, they put away the idolatry. They knew that got them into trouble. They were not going to go into idolatry anymore. But however, by the time this book was written, they had become so bored of worshiping God that all they care about is to give the minimum. I'm just here, and let's get it done, and let's go home. And that's how people view the worship of God at the time. What is the minimum we can give? How little can I give and still go? 
How little can I give of myself, of my time, and still worship God? And you know, I guess Malachi still goes on today because that is the state of many people in Christian circles. Many Christians. The devotion has become as little as we can give. What's the minimum I can give and still make it, right? Uh, People see it today. I don't know if you met people like that. And their devotion to life is just to get by. Just to get by has nothing to do with the worship of God or the service of God. It's just let's get it done so we can go back and do our normal things, which is take care of our home, take care of our family, take care of our careers. And they fell into this disrepute. They broke the promises that they made to God. Remember the covenants. Malachi is going to talk about covenants quite a bit. And the priesthood, of course, did not bother, did not bother to worship the Lord or bring people back to the scriptures. Um, And once you get away from the scripture, guess what happens? You don't think about being godly, you'll stop being good. You stop being godly, you'll stop being good. And so, therefore, your moral life is going to suffer. Your moral life is going to suffer. And so we see that, in, and I would say this as an example, it's an American culture. Most grandparents, people's grandparents here today, not today here, but in America, went to church and read their Bibles. Grandmas and grandpas went to church and read their Bibles. However, their grandsons and grandchildren do not do that. But they think they're just as good as grandpa and grandma because, hey, I don't need God to be good. Maybe for one generation you could be good without God. But unless you pass on God, the next generation will not be good. The next generation will not be good. That's what the priests failed to do. They failed to pass on God, and therefore the next generation became worse than the previous generation. And so we see people in the book of Malachi breaking the most fundamental area of relationships, marriage. They began to go away from God's ideal of marriage. Not only did they intermarry with pagans, but they also broke their marriage with their wives. The husbands broke their marriage with their wives. And they went on, and people became so filled with consumerism, so filled with uh, themselves, that that not only did they look at marriage as just something that you can just break off and do again. That's why they had so many second and third and fourth marriages. By the time you get to the New Testament, you see that problem. So, So you understand why Jesus dealt with that problem. When you see in the New Testament why they asked Jesus those questions. What about divorce? What about marriage? You understand that that came from the book of Malachi. Because Malachi was telling them, you have broken your covenant. You've married, you're intermarried with the pagan women. Uh, conveniently, they follow Solomon's example. But you also divorced your wife of your youth. And therefore, they fell into severe sin. And they asked Jesus, they wanted Jesus to agree with them. And of course, Jesus made it very clear that was not in the plan of God, not from the beginning. And so they abandoned their wives. They abandoned the worship of God. And if you abandon the worship of God, you'll ultimately abandon other people's relationships. When you fail to worship God and be devoted to God, you will fail at every other relationship. And we saw that. And you've seen that in the book of Malachi. Before we get into it, they start with this question. Because somebody needs somebody to blame. People in society, problems in society, and people blame. You've got to find somebody. So who do we people blame the most? This is an easy one. We were talking about that in our prayer meeting today. Who do people blame the most when there's problems in society? What's that? The president. Government. That's an easy one. A low-hanging fruit. And, of course, we see that today. Trump, the government, very convenient, right? Um, well, if you think about the government, they only have the power that the people have given them. It's actually the only money that they have is the money that they took away from people. But they blamed God. The Jewish people blamed God. And that's why we, got, we have to go through this intro, because otherwise it does not make sense. Chapter 1 will not make sense unless you know their state of mind, who they were blaming, 
And they blamed God and they said, well, he doesn't care about us. And since he doesn't care about us, guess what we're going to do? We're not going to care about him. And it was a tit for tat. He doesn't care about us. Look at, look at our condition. We are going to stop care about, caring about him. He stopped loving us. We're going to stop loving him. He abandoned us. We're going to abandon him. And so they believe that God did not care for them. And two things that were very, very important to remember when you read the book of Malachi, they didn't care because they believed that God did not care how you lived. If you lived a good life, God didn't care. And if you lived a bad life, he wasn't going to punish you either. And you know, that's the state of a lot of people's thinking today. God doesn't care if you live well, and God doesn't repunish. God doesn't punish if you behave badly. And therefore, what's the point? What's the point? By the way, when you read the book of Malachi, it's all in what they call prose. You know what prose is? Prose versus poetry? Prose versus poetry? No, okay. Back to your English class, if you can remember. They taught you that there are different kinds of writings. You can write in poetry or you can write in prose. By the way, the first five books of the Bible are written mostly in prose, meaning they're straightforward meaning. The book of Psalms is poetry. Hits the heart. Here's God saying, I'm going to talk to you directly. I'm not going to go to the heart. I'm going to talk to you face to face. That's why it's written in prose. Because the arguments that God gives are pretty straightforward and pretty much to dealing with the heart of the issue. But not, God's not going to make it into a poetry, beautiful style. It's going to go right to the mind. And he has a series of questions. He's going to have a series of questions. By the way, uh, these questions are all through the book, all the way to chapter 3. A series of questions that the... That the, uh, the writer, Malachi, is going to prose. And these are the questions that Israel had. The Jewish people had these questions. These nine questions are all going to come up through your reading. How have you loved us? How have we despised your name? How have we defiled or polluted you? What weariness is this? Why does he not? How have we have wearied him? How shall we return? How have we robbed you? How have we spoken against you? These are nine questions that the book reiterates. These are the people telling Malachi their questions about God. And so Malachi is sort of like the go-between. He's talking to the people. And by the sound of it, when you read it, he's getting heckled. It's like he's preaching in the marketplace and people are responding to him. How have we not loved him? How have we polluted him? And Malachi, an incredible job. He goes through point by point by point of each one of their questions, explaining what they did. By the way, there's 53 verses in this chapter, in this book. 47 of them deal with God speaking to the people. Over 85% of the book, it's God speaking to people. Meaning that if we were taken by percentages, it is the most has the most verses in which God speaks. Has the most verses in which God speaks. It is full of God's response to people. So if you ever wanted a book to say, where God speaks the most, Malachi. He would not be wrong. His name means my messenger. And some people have made it a point to say, well, maybe it was just some guy. Because the name means my messenger. It's not even a proper name. Malek, messenger. Maleki, the I at the end means my. Okay, so Malek means a messenger. Maleki or Malachi, the I, emphasizes possession. It is my messenger, Malachi, right? My messenger. And so it's God's messenger to the people. And he discusses things with the people for all this time. So let's look at verse 1, finally. Verse 1 of chapter 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. And I've made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says we have been beaten down, but we'll still return and build our ruins, 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down, and men will call them, uh, men will call them the wicked territory, and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. And your eyes will see this, and you'll say, the Lord be magnified beyond the borders of Israel. The first and foremost issue is that they lost their sense of God's love. They lost their sense of God's love. I have loved you. Look at verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. Look at their answer. How have I loved you? You know, how have you loved us, I should say? How? Right? God says one thing, and their question is, remember those questions that we put up? How have we loved us? How have you loved us? God responds, Jacob and Esau. Remember Jacob and Esau? If you remember your studies in the Old Testament, Jacob's brother Esau, who was the oldest? Esau, who was the blessing to? Supposed to? Esau, that's right. But what happened? Whom did God choose? Jacob. Why? Yeah. But before that, God said it was going to be Jacob, right? Why? The question is, why did he choose Jacob? The answer is, because God loves Jacob. You don't like it? Too bad. That's how God says it. He loves Jacob. And he hated Esau. Now, before you go out and run out of the place and go, oh, God hates and God loves, the problem with American English and even in our translation is we think of love and hate as emotions. The Bible doesn't put them in those terms. God, God, his love and his hate is not emotional. Love has to do with relating to somebody and taking care of them. Hating has to do with not relating to them and not taking care of them. So therefore, when God says, I love Jacob, is I am going to endear myself to Jacob and I'm going to take care of him. And Esau, I am not going to take care of him. I'm going to take care of Jacob. Why is he going to take care of Jacob? He loved him. And the promise goes back to Abraham. He made a promise. Now, God loves all nations and all peoples. But he has a special covenant with Abraham. He has a special promise to Abraham in which he will keep. Remember, God still blessed the children of Ishmael, and God still blessed the children of Esau, even though they were corrupt, even though they behaved badly. In fact, here we're going to have a, an interesting thought here in Malachi because God is going to take care of Jacob and he's not going to take care of Esau and God's going to remind them that where is Esau today? Where's Jacob today? Verse 3, I've hated Esau and I've made his mountains a desolation and appointed an inheritance to jackals and to the wilderness. Israel versus Edom. The name Edom is Esau. That's his name. Edom, red, the red mountains near the area of Petra. By the time you write, by the time Malachi was writing, following the prophecies of Obadiah, Edom, the Edomites, were destroyed, were destroyed because of their arrogance, because of their arrogance. They were sitting on Mount Seir, the big mountain. And they said to themselves, we'll never come down. Nobody will ever get to us. In fact, they did. God sent Arab nations to come against Esau, to come against Edomites. And they took them down, just like Obadiah said it would happen. And they were moved into the Negev, into the deserts of Egypt. And there, that place was called Edomian. And a very powerful Edomian person came out of that place who went to Julius Caesar and said, how much for the throne of Israel? Anybody know who was that? Herod, that's right. He bought the throne from Julius Caesar. He wanted to be the king over the Jews. It all goes back to this. Verse 4, Those Edoms, though Edom says, we have beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. The Lord says, they may build, but I will tear down. Jacob, don't you know how much I've loved you? Israel, don't you know how much I loved you? 
I have taken down Edom, your enemies. They have tried to rise up, and guess who took them down? Me, says the Lord. They built, I tore them down. They were stronger than you, but I tore them down. I've kept them away from you. I have blessed you. You're back in the land. Look at them. They're away from the land. They're away from Mount Seir. They're away from Edom. They're in destruction. By the way, uh, if you read the Psalm 137, does anybody remember that Psalm? By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remember Zion. No? Okay, you gotta got to go and read it. It's a fantastic Psalm. At the end of that Psalm, at the end of that Psalm, it's quite interesting. God, uh, the people says, God, remember Edom and remember Babylon. And then he says, remember how they smashed the baby's heads against a stone. And it's like, what, what is that verse doing in that Psalm? Well, if you know the history, when Babylon attacked Jerusalem, the Edomites jumped in the fray on behalf of Babylon, kicked Israel when they were down, and the Edomites took Jewish babies and smashed their heads against the stones of the wall in Jerusalem. And the Jews did not forget that. And they said, Lord, may you remember them. May you repay them back for what they did. The Edomites were horrible to the Jewish people. Horrible. And yet God kept the Jewish people. He brought them back. And now... Edom was absolutely in shambles, and Israel was back in the land. How have you loved us? I protected you. How have you loved us? I kept you. How have you loved us? Your enemies have been taken down. It's interesting. I find it very ironic that the children of Israel were complaining that God didn't love them, even though they were in a much better situation than their enemies. I find it ironic that American Christians complain about God not loving them. Don't you find it ironic, too? <laughs> the most blessed Christians in the entire world, American Christians, complain about the silliest things, about the most silliest things you can imagine. If you have any money in your account today, any money in your wallet, any money in your couch, you are richer than seven, the 93% of the world. You're richer than 93% of the world. And therefore, what do we have to complain about? But pastor, I have bills. Well, that might be true, but you had a choice on how you got those bills, right? You had a choice on how you got those bills. Therefore, before you complain, think about your choices about the bills you have. But nonetheless, it reminds me of Israel. How have you loved us? And you hear American Christians, oh, God doesn't love me. Yes, he does. Look where you live. Look what you drive. Look where you live. Look how much money you have in your account. Go to the Philippines with me next year, by the grace of God, and then come back and complain. Go to Thailand. Go back and complain. Go to Mexico. Not too far from here. See how much we complain. How have you loved us? I have blessed you, says the Lord. I blessed you so much, you're probably better than everybody else. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, we have a letter to the church of Ephesus. And Jesus talks to the church of Ephesus. And after all the good that they've done, he had one thing against them. What was it that he had against them? They forgot their first love. They abandoned God's love. They had it, but they left it. When we forget God's love for us, when we forget God's love for us, then we're going to leave God's love. We're going to forget it, and we're going to leave. They had abandoned the love of God they had at first, and therefore when they forgot it, they'll eventually leave it. And that's the first thing that happens to us. We forget how much God loves us. In fact, I love this verse, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. I praise the Lord, I got to teach on it a few months ago, feels like a couple months ago, when we got to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that it is the love of God through Christ Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. And everything else that we do should be based on that fact that God loves us, right? Israel deserved the judgment of God. They've done everything and anything possible to deserve the judgment of God. 
Yet, who received it, Edom or Israel? Edom. Ultimately, they, they were both judged by God, but God brought them back. God restored them. They had the mercy of God. They were spared the judgment of God. And so the same thing for me. I deserve God's judgment. Why God hasn't judged me? Why are there people that used to be in my circle of influence as a sinful person that God dealt with them differently than me? Why am I sitting here in a pulpit teaching God's word where some of them are either dead or in jail or in prison? I don't know where else. Why would that happen to me? Because God had mercy. Because God loves me. Should I complain? I shouldn't. But man, does it get tempting sometimes, doesn't it? And that's what Israel was dealing with. This was they were dealing with. God held Edom, and God loved Jacob. And then he remembered, God was reminding them. Question for Christians today, how do we remember God's love? What's one thing that we can do that we can remember God's love and not take it for granted? What's something that we can do as a church, not individual? Think of it as a church. Think of it as a, as a people, as a fellowship. What is something we can do together? What's that? Say it loud. Communion. That's right. Communion. We come to the Lord's table to remember how much he has loved us, how much he did for us. So it's good. That's why he says, as often as you do this, gather together and take it together to remember God's sacrifice for us, right? We go out and share the gospel time and time again. People go out and do it, and I've seen it. And nobody gets saved. Very little people get saved. And people get fed up, and then they begin to quarrel with each other. They begin to argue, and then the work goes by the wayside. They say it's worthless. We don't have to do it anymore. Nobody gets saved. And they, they forget the love of God in that ministry. You're not doing it because people are going to get saved. That, that is a wonderful thing that happened. You're doing it, first of all, out of sheer obedience to what he said. And even if one person got saved, it is well worth every effort possible. And so, therefore, every effort possible is based on the love of God. I believe Jesus is coming soon, very soon. But even if it happened in 100 years from now, right, and everything that we did today just gets forgotten, right? An eternity, not an eternity, but in the world, it gets forgotten. Does God still love us? Absolutely. So we do it out of the love of God, right? We do it out of the love of God. If we forget, if we forget um, about the love of God, every ministry will go by the wayside. It's like a slope heading to disaster. If we forget why we're doing it, we're doing it because God loves us. And that's what Israel forgot. That's what the Jewish people did. They forgot that God loves them. But now he's going to deal with the priest. Look at verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. Then am I a master? Where's my honor? And if I'm a master, where's my respect, says the Lord of hosts? O priest, who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? What's the next problem? Well, first of all, we had unfor uh, unthankfulness, right? They forgot the love of God. Here's the next problem. They begin to despise the Lord. They begin to despise the Lord and his work. Not only his work, but two specific things that is quite interesting here. They forgot the love of God, but then they began to defile and despise his name and the altar. We're going to find out in a minute. But here's the sins of the priest. He says, I am a father to you. Here's one example that is quite interesting in the Old Testament. God is represented as a father. It's not a New Testament term. Some people think it's a New Testament term. It is not a New Testament. There's an Old Testament term in which Paul draws from. Abba, Father. Am I a father to you? It's also from the book of Hosea. Aren't you not my son, Israel? Am I not your master? You see the balance there of father and master? Why does God always show that balance, right? It's not just always father. It's not always master. It's both of them together in a nice, wonderful Balance. Anybody know why? God always balances out the two. 
I'll just give you the answer then. Father, you can have an issue with your father. You can take your father for granted. But he's your master too. He owns you. He's not only your creator. He is your Lord. He's your master. And therefore, as much as disrespect you may have toward your dad, you will not have the same disrespect as you would have for your master, owner, right? He is your Lord. And so they've forgotten the Lord. They've forgotten to honor the Lord. They've forgotten the fear of the Lord, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of wisdom. And here's verse 7. How have you despised my name? Verse 7, you are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In, what, in, in that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised, right? God is dishonored by the priest, the priest. Now, when we think of the priest in the Old Testament, we think of someone like this. And it's true. They were the Levites, the sons of the Levites. They were to represent God before the people and the people before God. Now, in the New Testament, we don't have priests like this anymore. That is under the Mosaic law. However, the idea of priest is not forgotten in the New Testament. Who are the priests in the New Testament? Every born-again Christian. That's right. Every born-again Christian is a priest. It's called the priesthood of all believers. So it did happen to the priests in the Old Testament. It really did happen to the Levites. They began to dishonor God and despise the Lord. But has that happened also to Christians today? Well, if we've forgotten the love of God, it doesn't take too long for Christians to begin to despise the Lord. Now, the word despise doesn't mean you hate it. It just means that you don't... What's that? Yes, but it has to do with the fact that you despise it, but you still do it. But you give very little into it. Remember the idea of how little can I get away with, right? Uh, and here's what they did. They took the sacrifices that are described in the Mosaic Law. By the way, remember, they're still under the Mosaic Law. Right? There's no New Testament yet. This is the law of God. This is the word of God. This is for Israel. They were still under that covenant. Therefore, they had to commit to that covenant. It was faithfulness to the covenant. So instead of bringing the best, the best of the lambs, the best of the rams, the best of the sacrifices, they brought what? <laughs> they brought the worst. They brought the cheapest, the blind, the lame, the crippled. They didn't care because it was a sacrifice. Hey, God wanted a sacrifice. I'll give it to him, right? That'll do. Right? That'll do for the Lord. I brought it. And they were not giving their best to the Lord. Now, how does this apply to Christians today? Because it's an interesting question, right? How does this apply to Christians today? Have we despised the Lord? Have we dishonored the Lord when it's simply the Lord gets? That'll do for the Lord today. Those five minutes in the morning those rush hour things that we just get through just to get by, right? Because we want to appease our guilty conscience. The Lord is not wonderful anymore to the Jewish people here. The word wonderful has to do with that word, wonderful, full of wonder, full of wonder. What does full of wonder mean? You ever seen a little kid when he sees uh, uh, something amazing? You know, I took my kids to the zoo and they're just like, whoa, look at that animal. Look at that creature. And they're like, wow. And so as a kid with a caterpillar or a ladybug or something, right, it's full of wonder. They can't imagine it's something so great. Well, the Lord is to be like that for us. He's wonderful, full of wonder. Is he still full of wonder to you? Or has it become just an old, faded, black and white picture that you keep around because, hey, you can't throw it away? And you look at it once in a while. You look at it once in a while. And you'll say, well, that'll do for the day. And that's how the Jewish people were doing. They were spending more time in, you know, the things that they had to do, the urgent things, rather than the important things. You know what I mean by urgent things and important things? There's always going to be urgent things. In ministry, everything seems like an emergency. 
but it's not the most important thing. And we spend a lot of time on the urgent things. Oh, I got to get this call. Oh, I got to do that. Oh, I got to pick this up. Oh, I got to do this instead of the important things. What is the most important thing? The Lord. The Lord. Look what it says, verse 8. When you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? When you give the sacrifices that you don't care to give, so you give, bring the cheapest. You bring the ones that you don't want. Um, isn't that evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, isn't that evil? Why not offer it to the governor? They were under the Persian Empire at the time. He says, why don't you go and take it to the Persian governor? See if he likes it. <laughs> He wouldn't do that, would he? The governor of Persia, he would tell them to get away from them. They brought him some cheap sacrifice. They wouldn't do it to the governor. Why would they do it to God? Isn't that interesting? There are things that you and I wouldn't do to other people out of respect. Yet, because familiarity breeds contempt, we do that to the Lord. We do that to the Lord. Our worship, our devotion, right? Are singing. When you come together on Sunday mornings, we don't have singing on Wednesday, so it doesn't really apply to Wednesday, but if we did, is it, is it really a worship and a devotion? Or is it just get past those 30 minutes so we can get on with it, right? So we can get on with it. Yet, you go to God with it, he says. You bring the leftovers, and you keep your best for yourself. And you keep your best for yourself. You defile it. Verse 9. Now, you will not entreat God's favor, but now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of your kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were among you who would shut the gates that you might, be, you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. After all their disobedience and all of their wrongdoings, they said, could we still get God's grace? Can we still get God's favor? Right? Can we still get it? <laughs> you know, it's like, the, it's like the friend you have who's done all they could to insult you and get away with it. And, and they, they, they come against you and they said, can I, can I still borrow some money from you? They were still coming to God on gratitude, right? No gratitude, despising, defiling. And they said, but we still get it? Can we still get the grace of God? God says, I am not going to accept your offerings. I am not going to accept your offerings. Your offering is empty, says the Lord. Your offering is empty. You observe empty things because your heart is not in it. You don't care about it. It has become an empty religion. It has become an empty religion. Um, you don't care how you do it. You just bring the sacrifices and you just, whatever. You bring the, ca the, la the, the calf, the lame, the blind, the, the broken, and you say, oh, we did it. We serve the Lord. And you know, many times for Christians, this is the case. Remember, we're making the, the, the comparison. Christians in the New Testament are called priests. These are the priesthood. The altar of the Lord, where the sacrifice was laid. We don't have the same thing as they had in the temple, but we have an altar of sacrifice. Anybody know what that is in the New Testament? The altar of sacrifice. What is that one? Where was the sacrifice made? On the cross. That's right, on the cross. The cross of Jesus. Have we despised the cross? Well, how do we despise the cross? When we don't pick it up and take it with us. When we come to church and we say, man, that's a good song, that's a good sermon, I'll leave my cross here until next week. And you come and pick it up next Sunday and you leave it here back and if you go back and do your normal thing, you defile the Lord. You despise the Lord. Because all you want to do is just come and just get it done. Here's a few things for the Lord. Here's a couple of crumbs. Here's my change, Lord. And you go on and do your, do your thing. 
as it would be, right? Some people, some people do the same thing in ministry. This is, again, a large body of work in ministry. What I have seen and observed, right? People don't care how they do it. That's one thing I've seen. People don't care how they do ministry. They just, they just do it haphazardly. They just show up sometimes, <laughs> and they just do it. They just, well, okay, done. Are we, gone? Are we done yet? And it's done, and they go. And it's like, wow, what happened, right? And they do it bad. And they do it so bad, it might as well not done it all. But people believe that's ministry. And so at least I showed up. And people have a responsibility, not only to do it, but how they do it. How they do it. You ever read that uh, Oswald Chambers devotional? Right? Anybody know what that one's called? My utmost for his highest, right? I sometimes in ministry, it's frustrating to see Christians do haphazardly. They just do it because maybe, maybe they signed up. <laughs> And they just have to do it because now they feel bad because they don't do it. But they do it in such a way that they don't really care to do it. They just, it's like bringing a calf, lame and crippled, before the Lord. And say, I did it. That'll do it. And it's frustrating because I see other people, believers in ministry working so hard. And other people in ministry not care at all to give anything if they show up at all. And it needs to be said because the Lord doesn't accept that. It didn't accept it to the Jewish people. It won't accept it to Christians that have the full revelation of God in Christ Jesus in the New Testament. And the priest, right? And we are priests. How do you serve? How do you minister? Right? Is it just to get by? Or is it really a devotional out of the love of God because you love him because he first loved us? Verse 11 from the rising of the sun, even to the setting thereof, my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord. And in every place, incense is going to be offered in my name. And grain offering that is pure for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you are profaning it, in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled. And as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. Again, there's New Testament comparison, isn't it? They were despising the Lord. His table, his altar, his sacrifices. Let me ask you this. Christians, is there sacrifices in the New Testament? The answer is yes. Don't be shy. Who is the sacrifice? You. <laughs> you. Right? He is the ultimate sacrifice. You're right. But Romans 12 says, bring yourself as a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable, which is your reasonable or your worship to the Lord. We worship service to the Lord. How do we bring ourselves to the Lord? Have we come defiled? Have we come just haphazardly? So I'll give myself to the Lord on Sunday, but the rest of the week is mine. And the Lord's table. What is the Lord's table in the New Testament? The communion table. How do we come to the communion table when we take it? Is it defiled? Is it defiled by our sin, attitude, bad relationships, hatred for others, indifference to others? God's name is going to be great, he says. God's name is going to be great among the Gentiles. In fact, he's saying, even the Gentiles honor me, Jewish people. Even the Gentiles honor me, but you despise me. And look what they say, verse 13. Verse 13 says, my, how tiresome it is. What a burden. Ah, God's worshiping God is so burdensome. My goodness. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. You ever seen something like that? Just ah, ah, so tired of serving the Lord. What a burden, right? People may not say it, but they certainly behave that way. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring what was taken by robbery, the lame, the sick, and you bring an offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? Should I even bother taking it from you when you'd serve it like that? How tiresome it is. How burdensome it is. Put it in New Testament term. It's too hard to follow the Lord. 
have Christians told me this before. It's too hard. I don't want to, I don't want to keep doing it. It's too hard. It's too hard to study. It's too hard to read. It's too hard to come. It's too hard to fellowship. The Lord will say, should I even receive it? Should I even receive it from you, Jewish people? Should I even receive that? Verse 14, but cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows for it for sacrifices, a blemished animal to the Lord, for I am a great king. Here's one of the things that Malachi is going to pronounce about the Lord, that he's a king. We have read that he's a father. We have read that he's a master. We have read that he loves us. And now he says, he's a king, says the Lord. And my name is feared among the nations. My name is feared. This is what they had. They had an empty religion. They did it. Don't get me wrong, if it was based on you know, sacrifice and based on uh, attendance at the temple, they checked the box. <laughs> you know, they, they were there. But have we ever come to that point where we were just, just there? We came, and if someone says, hey, were you there last week? Yeah, I was there. What happened? I checked the box. I was there. Did you take communion? Yeah. Did you serve? Yeah, I was there. I got out of there very quickly after that. Did anything change? No. Just same thing. Just same old Sunday. You know, same old, same old. Boy, I dread the day that I would ever say same old, same old when I came to fellowship and the worship of God. I might as well close up. <laughs> or put the church name Laodicea on the front. <laughs> That's what I should do, if it ever came to that. A few things to remember as we listen in stereo, right? What does it mean, stereo? Listen to the New Testament along with the Old Testament. His name, my messenger, Malachi. Remember, the I at the end means my, my messenger. In the New Testament, who becomes God's messenger? That's right. Another way of saying my messenger is my witness. You are my witnesses, says the Lord. Acts 1.8, you will be empowered to be a witness unto me, says the Lord. You're going to be my witnesses. Malachi was a witness to or a messenger to the people. The table of the Lord. They had a table of the Lord in this Old Testament sacrificial system. We have a table of the Lord in the New Testament. The Lord's table, the communion, the Lord's supper. The altar of the Lord, they despised. They just they, they did whatever, whatever sacrifice they can bring. The lame, the sick, that's the cross of Jesus in the New Testament. Don't despise the altar of the Lord. This is where our sin was atoned for. And our sin was atoned for, and Jesus invites us to pick up our cross and follow him. The priests were so sinful against the Lord. Who are the priests again in the New Testament? We are. And by the way, the sacrifices is us, a living sacrifice. All those things need to be in line with God's will for it to be true worship, for it to be true worship. And all of it, they failed. The Jewish people failed because they forgot the love of God. If we forget that God truly loves us and we get to do this, service him, minister to him, minister to one another, because God loves us, when we forget that, it's when everything goes downhill in our service for God. We're going to despise it. We're going to mistreat it. We're going to misuse it. Next week, we're going to look at something very interesting because those very priests, God is going to deal with them. And he says, the priest, you're not honoring me. Take him to the priest. They were supposed to be God's witnesses, God's messenger. He even says... You priests are my messengers, verse 7 of chapter 2. We'll get to that next week. But you're preaching a popular message to the people. Okay? You're giving the people what they want to hear. You tell people, just, just enjoy God and don't listen to them. Just enjoy it. Just go out and do whatever you want. You're supposed to be teaching them God's word. You're supposed to be fearing God. You're supposed to be a God-fearer, not a man-pleaser. 
And they were doing quite the opposite. They were asking the people, hey, what do you want to hear today? Hey, do you want me to teach you something about the law? And the people didn't want to hear it, so they began to soften their message to the point where it was became so seeker sensitive that it did not have any effect on them whatsoever. And all they did is become yes men. They did what the people wanted them to do because they got paid. They got paid. The priest got paid from the sacrifice from the offering. They weren't going to touch the offering. Yeah, they, they needed to keep that money coming in. And if they preach an unpopular message, guess what would happen to the offering? It would not be there. Therefore, the priest compromised. And they preached a message that was very soft, soft on sin, easy on the people. And God says, I'm going to deal with you. That's next week. It's a tough message, isn't it? But Malachi says, haven't I loved you, says the Lord? The people said, in what way? Has God loved us today? Has he loved us? I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm talking about today. He has. Have we come complacent in our service for God? Have we forgotten the love of God? When we do service for God and minister, do we do it so haphazardly that it doesn't matter when we show up, how we do it, and what's the outcome? It doesn't matter. Because, hey, that's what, God, that's what God's going to get. But if we were to do that to maybe someone else, we wouldn't even dream of doing it. But because God doesn't behave like that, we tend to think that it's okay to do it. Oh, boy, Malachi says, come back to the Lord. He's giving you another chance. And so from chapter 2 to 4, after presenting the problem, chapter 2 to 4 is God's way of saying, come back to me. Let's talk. Let's resolve this issue. I'm going to talk to you about your priesthood. I'm going to talk about your message. I'm going to talk about your marriage. I'm going to talk about your relationship with your kids. And finally, those who remember the Lord and those who talk about the Lord are going to be put in a book of remembrance and they're going to be protected in the day of the Lord. Malachi takes us right into the end times. It's a fascinating book. After talking about just the things of Israel, it's like he hits a fast forward button, you know, like supersonic speed, and pff, it takes us right into the day of the Lord, right into us, into our time. So it is to say, Malachi still speaks very much to our day and age. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for every good and perfect gift that you give to us. Lord, we're sorry that we have been complacent. We see in the example of Israel what not to do. So, Lord, forgive us and restore us. We praise you tonight that you reminded us, Lord, that you are, uh, you are a king. You are our God who loved us. You are our master and you are our father. And, Lord, we ask you that you would help us in our endeavor to serve you and serve others to do it up to up to the best of our ability, to the highest capability that you have given us. We want to fulfill our calling, and we want to honor you and not despise you. We praise you tonight, Lord. Work in our hearts, Lord, as we do not want to forget that you love us. And because you love us, Lord, we have a great calling in ministry and in serving you and serving others. Let us not forget, Lord, how much you have loved us so that we will never despise you, will never defile you, and will always have, Lord, an upbeat and a dynamic relationship with you. In this we ask, Lord, in Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Take a water break. We'll come back.